Chicago is a bustling city, the largest metropolis in the Midwest. But Lisa Kerberg is missing out on the daily rush of activity. A physician, wife, and mother of two, she is mostly homebound as she struggles with a rare disorder shrouded in mystery that is known as acute intermittent porphyria, or AIP. This disease honestly has, has destroyed my life. <laughs> to be realistic, it really has. It's completely destroyed my life. I've had to quit working and um, I just spend a lot of time sick. Lisa was diagnosed with AIP after a harrowing medical ordeal two years ago. The disease got very, very severe in September of 2013. I had severe abdominal pain, um, abdominal distension, a lot of muscle weakness. I started getting some paralysis in my legs, arms, um, difficulty breathing, short of breath. I couldn't eat or drink anything. Um, continuous vomiting. And, and mostly it was the severe pain that, that took me to the emergency room. I mean, I couldn't even drink a sip of water. That's how sick I was. Dr. Carl Anderson, a professor at the University of Texas Medical Branch in Galveston, Texas, says AIP is a metabolic disorder caused by an enzyme deficiency that primarily involves the liver. Acute intermittent porphyria, or AIP, is uh, it's a genetic disease, and uh, it's uh, inherited from one parent, and so it's called autosomal dominant inheritance. Dr. Joseph Bloomer is director of the Porphyria Center at the University of Alabama in Birmingham. There are eight total porphyria disorders, four of which are called the acute porphyrias, and the acute intermittent porphyria is one of those four. The prevalence of the acute porphyrias is estimated in the USA to be about uh, five cases per 100,000 people, so it's rare. Uh, but acute intermittent porphyria is the most common one and it accounts for 80% of the patients. Many people with the genetic defect linked to AIP never develop any symptoms. Interestingly enough, most of the patients who carry the genetic defect for acute intermittent porphyria don't have any clinical manifestations of the disease. 70 to 80% don't have that. It's inherited equally by uh, men and women, by males and females, but it's more commonly active in females. And that's probably partly due to uh, female hormones, uh, but that doesn't seem to be the full ex explanation. And we're still uh, trying to find out why some people with this, who inherit this abnormal gene get sick and others don't. Although women are more commonly symptomatic, certainly there are many women who never get symptoms there are other factors that must be entering in to play against that enzyme defect and bring out the, the problem. There are a wide variety of medications that can bring out these acute attacks in the liver. The other thing that we know about is that will bring out an acute attack is fasting, or more to the point, lowered carbohydrate intake. Many women who in the phase of the menstrual cycle called the luteal phase will develop an attack and we think it's due to one of the, the sex hormones and more specifically progesterone. The other thing is infections can do it, alcoholism can do it, um, so we, we need to take notice of those as well. Some of the most common symptoms of AIP include abdominal pain, nausea, and vomiting. They can get uh, uh, confusion, hallucinations, anxiety. One of the early symptoms is insomnia, which may occur a day or two before an attack begins. They can get seizures. 
and uh, the effect on the uh, muscles, that on, the, on the nerves that control the muscles can lead to weakness, which often begins in the arms and the shoulders and uh, can progress to involve the lower extremities. And it can even lead to uh, muscle weakness in the chest and the diaphragm causing uh, trouble breathing. So it can, those manifestations are very similar to what we used to see in polio. Patients usually need to be hospitalized. The uh, pain is, is very severe usually and, and requires narcotic analgesics like morphine. What Lisa Kerberg remembers most about her AIP attack in 2013 was the burning pain. I'll never forget that pain, actually. I mean, it is, it is the worst pain ever. It's like, you know, sometimes it feels like someone has a branding iron and they're just pressing on my intestines inside, from the inside and through to my back. It's just severe. It's like a fire. It's a heat to it. Um, it's actually torture. It really is. It's, it's the worst thing ever. It's seriously not compatible with life. And I mean that truly. And I'm in the hospital and I thought, I can't survive now. And I was really, really sad because I have two old kids and I thought, this is so horrible. I'm not gonna be able to see my kids grow up because I can't live like this. And I actually started looking for a window that I could open or get out of somehow. I felt like I was on fire. And it, it made me think of, in the situation with the World Trade Center, when you saw the people jumping from the top, Recognizing AIP can pose a challenge for health professionals. In Lisa's case, two weeks passed before she was diagnosed with AIP. I had a whole array of testing done, um, CAT scans, I had a colonoscopy, upper endoscopy. You know, every test was done basically. Everything came back normal. So that's the problem, is it just doesn't make sense to doctors. The problem with diagnosis is that it's it's a rare disease and also the symptoms mimic so many other conditions. I mean there are many common conditions that cause abdominal pain and uh, the pain in other parts of the body is also very nonspecific. So patients can get very sick uh, without uh, the disease being diagnosed. If AIP is suspected, physicians can confirm the diagnosis with a relatively simple test that measures the level of a substance called PBG in a patient's urine. Very high levels of PBG will be found in sick patients who have AIP. The testing is absolutely critical for establishing the diagnosis. There is treatment for patients with AIP who are suffering an attack. It is important to recognize the disease promptly because uh, then uh, we have appropriate treatment, which is uh, beneficial and can be life-saving. Um, but if the disease isn't diagnosed, then uh, that treatment cannot be applied. Due to the intensely painful nature of an AIP attack, patients and their physicians should take steps to avoid triggering these episodes. Dr. Anderson says that the diet can play a key role in managing the disease. The diet that's recommended is a high carbohydrate diet, and actually the normal diet is uh, higher in carbohydrate than either protein or fat. So a normal diet is usually adequate. People need to stay on a steady diet and uh, avoid uh, crash diets to lose weight because that can make the disease worse. Lisa has found that milkshakes help her stave off attacks of AIP. For some reason, when I have a chocolate milkshake, it really, really helps my symptoms. I can drink a chocolate shake like right in the beginning of an attack, and it literally like kind of halts it. And I've had times where I've drank a chocolate shake and not even need pain medication that day because I've had the chocolate shake. So now I'm, for maintenance right now, I'm having a chocolate shake each day. <laughs> Just for the last, I'm trying to see if that'll help. Lisa also is receiving treatment, but so far, milkshakes and medications have not been enough to stop the attacks and restore her health. I spent a lot of time in hospitals and infusion centers, and I just never got well. I can tell when a new one's coming, usually, because I start to get a little bit agitated, and I start to feel almost like this burning in my, in my brain. It's very weird. It's like a weird headache comes on. The headaches are typically followed by recurring abdominal pain. 
when a new attack is starting is literally feels like a fire in my abdomen. It feels like hot coals and this pressure and just building, building, building and then the vomiting starts. Researchers are hoping to learn more in the future about how enzyme imbalance in the liver can cause such excruciating discomfort. They also are seeking to find out why patients like Lisa have multiple attacks while others with the same genetic defect never experience symptoms. We'd like to better understand the neurological symptoms and what causes them because if we understood those be that better, we would be able to, uh, we might be able to find a way to uh, prevent them. Experts also hope to get more information about how many people have the defect linked to AIP. Genetic testing is recommended by the experts. Dr. Anderson also is focused on building awareness of AIP so that the disease can be diagnosed more accurately. It's a, a disease that um, physicians should be ready to recognize and if, if the disease is diagnosed then it can be effectively treated. So that's been our main message for many years to uh, try to acquaint uh, physicians and the public more about this uh, disease. Lisa is hoping her physical condition will improve. For now, she is taking life one day at a time and finding enjoyment and happiness where she can. So I just focus on making it through each day and I just focus on the little things like just my children really. It's like my only focus right now is getting through each day and seeing my children and being with them. For more information about acute intermittent porphyria, please visit these websites diagnosingaip.com and porphyriafoundation.com.